Hello, fellow investors. My name is Charles Langford. I'm the president of uh, Biz Experts. That's B-I-Z, Biz Experts, Inc. And the primary reason for this particular video is that this is a replay of a conference call that we held on uh, this past Saturday on uh, June the 25th. Today is June 29th, 2016. Now, this conference call was about the following. Hope you can see this. And by the way, for those of you guys who are not in a position where you can watch anything on a video, I only have about uh, four little slides that I want to share. So don't worry about missing these slides. This is just for information uh, because, like I said, the primary reason for this video is just a replay of the conference call. But the uh, name of the series is Structure Wealth. This will be Series 1. So the telephone number for getting onto this series is area code 712-432-3900 and the ID to get on the call is 981120 with the pound sign or the, um, um, I forget what other thing you call that pound sign, but the ID is 981120. This call will take place every Saturday morning from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time. And it did start June 25th, and uh, the last class will be July 16th. Now, it is my desire to have all of the replays available on YouTube so that if you do miss a class, you will be able to uh, get caught up. Now, the next little slide that we want to pull up is just what the uh, conference call will actually cover, what it will entail. So again, the uh, Structure Well series, the first class uh, was dealing with entities, their attributes and how to use and maintain them, the best ways to structure your entity in order to get corporate and business credit, advantages in joining a team and building together uh, your business and taxes. So that uh, took place June the 25th. The second class that will take place on July 2nd will cover such things as identifying your niche, developing a strategy for your niche, identifying what kinds of tools you will need, how the team can help you build special needs housing. Class number three, which will be held on July 9th, uh, will cover ensuring that you know what to do, pipeline for leads, exit strategies, funding, and etc. Now, the uh, Series 2 is only for team members, and uh, we will announce when that will start. It won't cost any money to actually join the team, but there will be requirements for team members because, again, we want to build as a team. It's our desire, really, to have our teams all over the country where when we're working with uh, special needs housing and other programs, uh, especially when we're dealing with our nonprofit and acquiring properties from HUD, we'll be able to do that all over the country. So I don't know if you guys are aware that if you're a nonprofit, you can get the uh, HUD foreclosures before they're made uh, available to the public, and we can get those at 30% discounts. So we'll be putting teams all over the country to take advantage of those kind of situations. Now, these slides may not be up long enough for you to truly read through them, but remember, this is all uh, on, um, you know, on video. So all you'd have to do is just pause, and you can go back and take your time and really read through the slides. So this is my resume, and you can see it's rather lengthy, but I wanted to make it available to you because not only will we, will we be talking about real estate, but we'll be talking about building an organization. And so I just wanted you to have a little bit more background information on me. So without further ado, we will go ahead and get right into this past Saturday's conference call. should be on mute, so I won't be getting any response, but we shouldn't have any interruption. All right, so the, one of the purposes of this call today is, of course, to talk about how we can handle our various entities and which entities would really be good for what we're doing as real estate investors. And so the major entities would be C corporations, S corporations, LLCs, that would be limited liability companies, 
and limited partnerships. Oh, well, I didn't realize that we would have so much distraction on the call. I think I have everyone muted, but I hear a lot of interference. So hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Could someone say something to make sure that uh, it's on mute? Yes, do you hear me? I can hear you, so it's not on mute. Let me try it one more time. Um, let me see, mute. So if I, hold on. Okay, great. Everyone now is on mute. If you really do have a question, you can unmute by pressing star one and ask me a question. Now, when I respond to your questions, I may say that uh, I will email that information to you. Uh, and if you want uh, more clarification, all you'd have to do is just hit your unmute and just ask for um, details. I'll make a note of that, and I'll make sure that I get that detailed information out to you. Okay, again, let's talk about the entities. We have C corporations. We have S corporations, which really are pass-through entities so that you can pass through your tax situation treated as a partnership, so that way the partners are actually uh, dealing with the taxes and not on a corporate level. And then LLCs are basically the same thing. You have a pass-through situation where you can pass through your taxes on to uh, either yourself or other entities. So what I want to do is give you a story. I call it the... Um, Cousin Benny story, and this is going to give you some insight as to how these corporations are taxed. Now, this story, of course, is a hypothetical story that's never happened, but here's the way the story goes. I have a Cousin Benny, and Cousin Benny got the family together several years ago to open a restaurant. So the family pooled their resources together, opened the restaurant, and the family members over the past few years then have been donating their time. They'll go in, work the restaurant, either cutting up food, sweeping the floor, the cashier, whatever the family needed to do to fill in to help the operation go. So now the restaurant is doing very well. It's earning seven to $800,000 a year. And what Uncle Benny did then was he set it up as a C corporation because his accountant at the time and his lawyer said, look, you want to have limited liability, so you need to incorporate. You don't want to do this under your own name. So Cousin Benny set up the C Corporation. Now, several years later, the restaurant is doing so well, Cousin Benny decides, hey, I want to disperse this income to the family. And so what he does then is he pays uh, for the restaurant, on behalf of, of the restaurant, he pays the state and federal government. That would be the IRS and, of course, his local state government. So let's say that he pays um, $175,000 in total taxes. Now he has leftover monies to distribute to the family. Now, the way he sets up his plan is that he would like to retain $100,000 in the business as retained earnings, and he would like to distribute $400,000 to the family. Now, Uncle Benny is an employee of the restaurant. He works the restaurant himself full-time. So his salary is, has already been dealt with in terms of the uh, company working out his expenses. In other words, after taking care of all the expenses, then it pays federal and state income tax, and that's on a corporate level. And most of you guys on the call have already received the uh, corporate tax rate. For those of you guys who have not pulled it up yet, the corporate tax rates go like this. If a corporation earns up to $50,000, the taxes would be 15%. Then as it goes over $50,000, the next tax rate is 25%. So now getting back to our cousin Benny situation. He then is passing out $400,000 to the family. When we're at our annual meeting, I open an envelope that Cousin Benny has given me, and it has $100,000 in it. 
Now, quite naturally, I'm excited about that. Wow, you know, I wasn't expecting this hundred thousand dollars. But then I think about it for a minute, and I say, Wow, wait a minute, I'm going to have to pay income tax on this hundred thousand. Now, the restaurant has already paid income tax on five hundred thousand dollars, and now I got to pay income tax on my one hundred thousand dollars simply because that one hundred thousand dollars was a dividend. So I say, hey, wait a minute, Cousin Benny, give me a moment. I want to set up something. I want to try to reduce my tax rate. And so he says, Charles, take as long as you want. It's your money. You just let us know what names you want us to put on the check. So I come back to Uncle Benny, and I say, Uncle Benny, look, if I got that $100,000 myself, that's going to boost me up to maybe a 20 23 25% tax bracket. So what I want you to do is make that check out to two corporations or two entities. That way, $50,000 will go to one entity, $50,000 will go to one of my other entities. That way, my entities will be paying a total of 15% each income tax. That tax rate would have been a lot better than me having to pay personal income tax on that money. So that's the Cousin Benny story <laughs> with an additional exception. Let me give you something else. I say, Uncle Benny, why don't you next year set up the restaurant in an LLC? Because an LLC has tax through taxation. So now the LLC, if it had $500,000, $600,000, in taxable income, the restaurant will not have to pay any income tax because it will not be taxed at the corporate level. So that $125,000 or $175,000 that you paid last year in corporate income tax will totally go away. You'll just pass on all of the earnings to its members. And now, as a member, when I get it, do I still want to have my name on it and pay personal income tax? Or do I want to set up my own corporation like I did this year? So the way things would be done next year is that the restaurant would be an LLC or an S corporation would pass through. That way there will be no corporate income tax for the restaurant. And now the owners as individuals will be responsible for setting up their own tax program. And in my case, since I didn't want the check made out to me, I will have a check made out to each of my two corporations. When the income continues to rise and rise and rise, and Uncle Benny would like to give me a check, let's say for $150,000, do I want to have that going to one entity, or do I want to split it up into three entities? Now, when I say three entities for me, again, those entities could be C corporations, S corporations, whatever I want them to be, and my entity then, I would want to have it taxed at a corporate rate. Because, again, from our tax tables, we see that the corporation only pays 15% on the first $50,000 worth of income, taxable income. So do I ever want one of my entities to have $70,000 worth of taxable income? Why would I do that? Why not just break it up into two entities? That way we're splitting it up, and none of my entities will be at over $50,000. Now, enough for the restaurant story. I hope you guys were able to follow that. What I want to do now, though, is give you information from two of my gurus. One, his name is J, the initial J, Douglas Jennings. He is an attorney out of La Jolla, California. That's near San Diego. Now, he specializes in taxes. He doesn't do divorce cases and lawsuits and all of that. His specialty is taxes. Now, the way he sets up the program is as follows. You come into his office, and he says, okay, you want me to handle your taxes. How much income do you earn? And let's say that you earn less than $250,000 a year. He then asks the question, well, how much income tax would you like to pay? 
Now, of course, you're going to be startled by this. You're going to say, what do you mean I must do a water pay? I don't want to pay anything. Doug's response is, no problem. If you earn less than $250,000 a year, you shouldn't have to pay any income tax. Wow, is that real? Talk to me. Let me know how can we do that. Now, I'm just going to give you an overview how he does it. And at some later point in time, I can give you more detail. But here's the overview of how he does it. He says, look, Charles, what we want to do, <clears throat> since you said that you don't want to pay any personal income tax, we're going to divert all of the income that you have to an entity, a, some type of corporation, LLC, C Corp, whatever the entity is going to be. We want to, do, to divert all of your income over to the entity. And there are ways to do that. For example, like if you worked in, in the, uh, if you were a nurse, rather than for the hospital to send you a check directly, have you as an employee on the payroll, then uh, uh, he would work towards getting you on some kind of a nurse's registry. Uh, way back in the day when I worked corporate America, we called them job shoppers or camp agencies or something, where you are not really an employee of the company. Then the company is going to treat you as an independent contractor <clears throat> and does not have to provide various benefits for you. Whoever you're working for, <clears throat> your temp agency, is going to provide you with all the benefits. Now, let's not look at that in any more detail right now. This is just an overview. The key thing is this. Doug says, look, what we're going to do is look at your personal situation and see what we can do in terms of creating you the most deductions that we can. So we may need to set you up some kind of home-based business, uh, but whatever we're going to do for you to have the most deduction. Now, let's say that, you're ho that you are a homeowner. As a homeowner, I'm sure that you guys realize that you can write off all of your property tax and all of your interest. So, again, if you're a homeowner, you're going to have typically more deductions than a non-homeowner. But the number is whatever the number is after Doug massages it. So let's say that he gets your personal deductions up to $20,000. Now, he does not want your income that you're going to draw from your entity as a salary, commission, or whatever you're going to call it. You're going to draw just enough income from your entity to not exceed your deduction by enough to cause you to have to pay personal income tax. So let's say that if you could actually earn, have taxable income of less than $9,000 a year, that you would not have to pay any personal income tax. So let's say that if your deductions were 20000 then you don't want your income to be over twenty nine. That way your taxable income is only $9,000. You only earn nine thousand over your deduction, so your taxable income is nine thousand. You don't pay any income tax on nine thousand, so that's the way he would set that up. Yeah, but Charles, what about all the rest of that money that the corporation has or the entity? Let's say that in this particular scenario, you actually earned, you had coming in a hundred thousand dollars. You only had twenty thousand dollars worth of deduction. You only want to go 9000 over that, so you're going to pull a salary, commission or whatever, of 29000 The rest of that is left with the entity, and I'll call it a corporation. What is the corporation going to do with all that money? Well, the corporation is going to have many more deductions than what you would have, than you, than what you would have had individually. So the corporation is going to write off all those deductions, and then what's left over, the corporation is going to set up a pension plan. And now the corporation can deduct what it's putting into your retirement or the pension plan for you. So now, after all the dust clears, the corporation had no taxes to pay. Now, this money that went into your pension plan, you will have to pay income tax on it when you pull it out. So understand that that pension money is called tax deferred. Now, let me just say this for a moment. I am not <clears throat> an attorney, and I'm not a CPA. So I'm just giving you guys 
some advice and some illustration. But what you really want to do is talk to your accountant or your attorney. Share with him some of these concepts that you'll learn on this call and work with them with your professional to put together your plan. Or you can always contact J. Douglas Jennings, and I'm certainly willing to give you his information out in La Jolla. What Doug does is um, about once a month, he will even give a free seminar that if you could make your way to La Jolla, it would be well worth your while to sit in on that. Another thing that, <clears throat> that Doug will do, and uh, back in the 90s, matter of fact, it was, no, actually it was in the 80s. We had Doug come out to Texas. <clears throat> I was working with Boom Assets at the time. And Doug came out and gave us a presentation, and he didn't charge anything to come out and do that. And I understand uh, last time I talked to Doug, he said, oh, yeah, he still does those kind of things as long as you could have an audience for him of 20 people. He will take care of all of his <clears throat> transportation and everything. You don't pay him. You just guarantee him that you have 20 people out, and he'll come out and give the presentation. So if you could get a church group together or a retirement group or uh, investors such as ourselves, I would love to get enough people in a given community with you guys helping out to have Doug come down as long as we could have 20 people there, and then you could get that information straight from the horse's mouth. All right, so just to recap, what is Doug saying? Divert all of your income over to your entity. Just draw enough salary so that you don't have to pay any personal income tax, and then let your corporation or your entity do the rest. Now, let me share with you <clears throat> some of the deductions that a corporation can have because it is really awesome. <clears throat> wow, I don't know what's happening to my voice this morning. I apologize. <clears throat> so let's look at it like this. <clears throat> let's say that I work for GE, which is a, we're going to think that it's a major company, GE, like General Electric. Now, here's the question. If I get a call from one of the VPs in GE, now keep in mind, I'm just an employee, and he says, Charles, I understand that you live out close to Ontario Airport, uh, which is in the greater Los Angeles area. And I say, yes, I do. I'm only six minutes from the airport. So he says, well, Charles, uh, there's someone coming in Saturday, and um, is it possible for you to pick them up from the airport. Now, this person who's coming in, uh, we want to uh, make a good, uh, establish a good relationship with them. They either work for another company that that uh, GE is trying to establish a relationship with, or maybe they're in the government, or for some reason, GE wants to, uh, you know, have an, some kind of an affiliation with that person. Charles, can you pick them up from the airport? Yes, I can, but I got a problem. My car is in the shop, and uh, I don't really have any transportation to pick them up. Well, Charles, can you rent a car? Well, yeah, I can do that. And Saturday when they come in, <clears throat> there's an event that they're going to. Uh, could you take them to the event? And you're welcome to, uh, you know, stay at the event yourself and take your family. Yeah, I can do that. And then we want you to take them back to the airport the next day. Now, here's the question. Can GE write all of that off of their income tax? For whining and dining, I think it says whining, whining <laughs> and dining, this person that they want to establish the relationship with. Can GE write it off their income tax? The answer is yes, they can. So now, instead of this really being GE, this is GE Prime. This is the company that I own. The president of the company, which was me, asked the employee, which is me, if I could pick up this person from the airport. And so all those other things that I just said, the renting of the car, the whining and dining, this person that the company's trying to make a good contact with, me taking my family to the event with them. Now, actually, the executive coming in was my mother-in-law, <clears throat> and the family has been talking about the family going to see the Lion King, which is a play. But you see, if I do all of that, under the corporate umbrella, then I can write all of that off. 
Now, how do I really get away with that? I would have to have some kind of a resolution or memo from the president, which is easy to get because I'm the president in this case, but I would put together the memo or whatever it is authorizing me to do that, and then I can write all, I can put all of that down, fund it through my own personal credit card, <clears throat> and take this memo and submit it to the finance officer or the corporation to get a reimbursement. So as long as I do my paper trail correctly and keep myself separated from my entity because I don't want to have any co-mingling. And this is the problem that most of us have gotten into with our entities and will continue to get into trouble with our entities if we're not careful. We should not co-mingle our assets, or if I have several different companies, you don't want to co-mingle company assets because once you do this co-mingling, then if you ever got sued, someone can quite easily pierce through what's called the corporate veil to get at you personally because you were not separated. This entity became just your alter ego. I repeat that. If the entity is proven to be just your alter ego and shared in assets, then when they pierce the corporate veil, they're getting the court to say, if they shared in assets, then they should share in liability. Okay? So, that ends that. The next guru that I want to talk about is a guy by the name of Ray Reynolds. Now, Ray was very popular in the Southern California area back in the mid-90s. Now, here is Ray Reynolds' approach to how you should do business. <clears throat> if you are close to some writing material, I would want you to put one circle. We're going to build a, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, a, a tree showing, uh, an organizational tree. So you're going to put one zero, and underneath that zero, that circle, we're going to put <clears throat> three entities, tie them to the circle. So if you've ever been to a multi-level marketing organization, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have, uh, like a manager, and then you'll have three um, uh, sub-managers under that person. So this first circle that we drew, <coughs> excuse me, according to the Ray Reynolds approach, I'll call it the Ray approach, that first circle is really going to be an entity that you will set up that will be exposed to the public. Now, it's going to be a generic entity. That particular entity is not going to... to suggest any particular kind of business. It's not going to be such and such investments, such and such uh, uh, beauty salon, such and such restaurant. It's just XYZ Corp. Now, when I say Corp, and I'll explain later how instead of Corp, it, it could be really any entity. It could be LLC. But I'm just going to say Corp. XYZ Corp is your first circle. Okay. Now, underneath that, you would have to decide what specific businesses do I want to operate. So if you operate operating a real estate entity, that real estate entity in Ray's scenario is just going to be a DBA under your generic corporation. If you also wanted to have a barbershop, if you also wanted to have an ad agency, like the way I've had mine set up for years, I would have an ad agency underneath my generic corporation. Why? Because I want to set myself up so that anything that I would like to purchase for myself or my family, I would want to be able to get it at a discount. So if I set up an ad agency just as a DBA, now when I'm ready to run my ads, the question is, could the ad agency get a better discount than the XYZ Corporation? If the answer is yes, then, of course, I want to have my ad agency. I'm the type of person who have a lot of vehicles, and I like the idea of being able to get discounts on my car parts. So what am I going to have under XYZ? It's going to be such and such automotive, so that uh, when I need to get discounts on uh, transmission or if I needed an engine or something, 
I set up a company so that I can get discounts on the merchandise. Now, as a real estate investor, 